I picked the wrong weekend to preach a two-hour message. No, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. For the past uh, <clears throat> few weeks, we've been looking at the book of Exodus. Book of Exodus. Book of Exodus is the second book of the Christian Bible and the uh, Jewish Bible, the Tanakh. Or the best way to say it is Tanakh. Tanakh. I should do that more if my voice feels better. Tanakh. And, and the reason I chose to focus on this book is because the, these Jewish people are, are a lot like us. They're, they're a lot like us. They're, it's like their story is our story. And the things they struggle with are the things that we struggle with. And the things, the, the way that God is dealing with them is the way he deals with us. And I see that all over the book of Exodus. Let me do just a, a, a quick review of kind of where we've been so far and bring us up to speed. Now, I'm going to abbreviate some things just for the sake of time, so bear with me. The nation of Israel, uh, just about 430 years-ish before this event, the, the crossing of the Red Sea, they were really a small group of folks, and it started with Joseph, well, kind of with Joseph. Joseph is now in, he was sold out by his brothers to slavers. Remember that story? Right? And he became, through God's will, uh, the second in command of all of Egypt. There's a word for that. It's called vizier. Vizier. And second in command. It's a word that's still used today. And he's put in this great position. And, and at the end of all of this, his brothers, they come into Egypt because Egypt, there's a famine. In it, and the only thing, place that's got food is Egypt. And, and so he finally reveals himself. They don't know who he is. They just think he's another Egyptian. And he says those famous words, famous to us now, uh, what you did, you did for evil, but God planned it for good. Remember that? But God planned it for good. And so now he, uh, Pharaoh allows him to move his family, about 70 people, his greater family. Maybe there are a couple of friends in there too, but about 70 people move into Egypt and they're safe now. There's food there and protection. And over the next 400 or four centuries anyway, those 70 people, they're like rabbits. I mean, and, and we learn from the word of God that there are probably 2 million people there. Some say even as, even as many as 3 million people. But they're there because of this famine. And Egypt was the only place that had food. And they were welcome when they were a small group of people. But now they're a, a large group contingency of people there and pharaohs the different pharaohs that come along and even to regular everyday garden variety Egyptians they're viewing these Israelis as a threat and so pharaoh they come up with you know they they're just treating them like slaves they're born when they're born they're a slave when they die they're a slave when they get up in the morning they're a slave when they go to bed at night they're a slave they're treated as slaves they make little or no money the Egyptians feel very threatened by their presence there. And so they're praying, God, help us, help us. So God raises up this young guy by the name of who? Moses. Moses. And Moses, he's, he's born into an Israeli family, but he's got this other, but he's raised primarily as an, as an Egyptian in Pharaoh's palace. And so Moses grows up, he winds up spending the next 40 years in the desert of where? Midian, the desert of Midian. And, and he, it's kind of like a training ground for, for Moses. And God, is, and so he has this encounter with God through this burning bush. And God is telling him, I want you to go back into Egypt and I want you to go to Pharaoh, and I want you to demand, let my people go. You know, that thing. That's the best I got, folks. That's it. There's no more. And he, let my people go. And, and Pharaoh pretty much laughs him out of the palace because his heart was hard. And, and, and they like slaves. They like having slaves. 
And so God unleashes the series of plagues on Egypt, which causes all kinds of damage. But Pharaoh continues to harden his heart until the 10th plague comes along, which involves the death of the firstborn of every Egyptian family. And the Israelis, you done? Okay. I got a mic and you're louder than me. <laughs> Go get another donut. Have one for me. And so, see, now I got to start all over again. We're taking this time to go through the book of Exodus. No, I won't do that. They avoid the plagues of, of God by doing this, by putting blood over what? The doorpost. And so when, when God comes, the blood of the lamb, which is spotless and without defect, and they commemorate this by observing what they call Passover, even to this very day. So fi finally, Pharaoh releases all the Israelis, and they're able to go. He says, get out of here, take your flocks, your sheep, your goats, whatever you got, take them, and just get out of there. And so now they're, uh, they're out, and I'm gonna, let me read some scripture to you. Let me, let me do this. And uh, guys, flash that up on the screen, if you would. It's uh, chapter 14. And verse, we're going to start at verse 10 uh, this morning. Let's hear the word of God. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelis looked up, and they were, there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, don't be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Now get on to verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a, water, a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. Now, verse 26, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters uh, may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak, the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing towards it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. Now, finally, verse 30 and 31. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. Let's pray together. Father, I pray, Lord, that you will uh, quiet our hearts, quiet our minds, open our hearts, open our ears to hear and our eyes to see. In Jesus' name precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. So you see here, what, to bring us up to where we need to be at this, at this juncture, uh, the Israelites, God has guided them by, during the day, what is he guiding them by? What kind of GPS? Right, a p pillar of, of what? Cloud and fire by night. And he's guiding them. He even tells them where to camp. And God is guiding them. He's taking care of them. And so they're out there, and then <clears throat> he's teaching them. Why is God taking them to the Red Sea? He's giving them, a, I'll, I'll just call it a Red Sea experience, a Red Sea experience. And some, somebody has said, 
Well, he's doing that because he's trying to uh, get them out of Egypt. A way of escape. But something else here. He's not only taking them out of Egypt, he's taking Egypt out of them, right? And God is doing this. And, and so when the people of Israel are camped at the spot that they were at, they were exactly where God wanted them to be. Exact, just the same with us, no matter what you're into today, no matter what you're going through. We'll get into this a little bit more here. God says this, I want you to camp in this exact spot by the Red Sea. Wherever you are today, that's where God wants you to be. God isn't ambushing you. He, he hasn't gone south somewhere. He's taken you exactly where you need to be. It's not random. It's not an accident. It's not catching God by surprise. Some of you, I know some of you are going through some things, and God has taken you. He's allowed that, and sometimes he's put you in that situation. Remember, the devil, uh, we, sometimes people are confused by this. You know, temptations come from where? The enemy. Temptations are designed to, to bring you down, right? But testing is a family thing. It's a fatherly thing. You know, I've tested our sons. All of our sons can tell you. You know, they, they went through tests, not to bring them down, but to bring them up. You know, not, not, to, you know, not to, to, to take them into some place where they can't go, but a setup. I'm setting them up for success in their lives. And all of our sons do well. Yeah, then they make good decisions. Because as a father, I've helped them to get set up. That's what, that's what fathers do that care for their kids. And so, but why did God bring these things? Because he wants to change them. He wants to change their minds. He wants to, to change their heart. God wants to change you today. Well, I'm pretty good. I, I think I'm the best I've ever been. There's a whole lot more change in the go on. There really is. But to, how does God do that? He allows us to go, th go through some things that we really don't want to go through. Right, Mike? We go through some things that when, when God wants to change us, he turns up the heat. Right? I think I already told you this. I know I have a couple of times that, motor, that bus we wanted to buy. Right? cost so much money, but I wanted this thing. I, I really did. It was the best thing. It had, had four slides on it, 42 feet long. I mean, this thing was a jet. You know, it was like Air Force One. It was great, but it, it cost, and we couldn't, we just bought a house, and now we were buying this, this thing. And so, how did God get my attention? Well, Money was always an issue, always an issue, isn't it? It's always an issue. Some of you are going through money things today, but it was an issue. So God, what does he do? He turns up the heat by turning down the bookings. And we always had great bookings. People asked us, other groups, to help them get bookings. We always had our five or six a week. We always had our 220 or 30 a year. It, we knew of other places other people could book. But all of a sudden, I mean, we were ahead two months, but I couldn't, book, I couldn't book a church to save my life. And the money started drying up. It's not that we were, you know, feasting all the time. But it got real tough. And, and so I quickly, I got an idea that, you know, I kind of sensed in my heart it was buying this thing was wrong. But I, I, wanted, Brad, I wanted to buy it. I loved it. It was great. Fortunately, I came to my senses, and God allowed us to sell it. Did we take a beating? Oh, yeah, we did. But you know what? Sometimes God takes you to the woodshed, right? Mike, you ever been to the woodshed? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes God does that in our lives. And when God wants to, to change us, he allows us to go through some difficult times. And, and what we brought out last week is that 
He wants to change our goals. Three things he wants to change. The first thing, we, we, we stopped with this last week. He wants to change uh, our goals. You know, when you're in a situation that seems impossible, what do you want to do? You want to get out of it, right? I'm sick. What do you want to do? I want to feel better. You know, I, 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 I've lost my job. What do I want to do? I want to get a new one, right? That's our goal, to get a new one. You know, what? And with the Israelis, we know how the story ends. See you, Mike. All right. Okay. Yeah, bring Barry with you. Bring Mark with you. Okay, we'll see you. Now we can talk about it. We, we know, I'm sorry, I'm so distracted this morning. Thanks. <laughs> we know how the story ends for the Israelis, but, but was, was that the goal for them? No, there was a bigger goal. God had a bigger goal for them, he, he, the, other than just the relief of his people. Look at Exodus 14, 4. I don't know if we have that up there. Uh, Jericho, but this is what it says. God says, but I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all of his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And that gets repeated over and over and over and over and over again in all of that. So what does it mean? God wants them to bring glory to him. What does it mean to get glory for God? It means respect, dignity, honor, reverence, importance, but there's another word. The Hebrew word is kavod, Kabod, and that means heaviness or, or, or weightiness. And so through this situation, God wants to demonstrate to everybody who's watching the awesome weight and strength and influence of his power, but not just that, but he wants to demonstrate his love. He wants to demonstrate his, his compassion for them. And you say, why would God do that? Why would he do that? Because God is good and God is loving. You know, our sons, Jeremy just left and Carol just left. They have an engagement and they're taking Mike with them. If Jer, you know, we, we disciplined our kids. I don't mean we took them and just whipped them. We didn't do that. But you can show love through a variety of things. And usually it was deprivation of something, freedoms, you can't go out. You can't go to this function. You can't do that. I'm going to tell a little story. I'll tell it quickly. I just, if Jerry was here, I wouldn't tell you. When, when our sons were real little, it wasn't, I, I, I would paddle them. I mean, I, did, I didn't beat them, beat them, but I, they, I got their attention. And I think the last time I paddled Jeremy was when he, maybe he was, three. I gave him a couple of whacks, but it got his attention. And so I would threaten, though, as, as you know, I'd say, I'm, I've told you four times, if you don't stop doing that, I'm going to spank you. They'd stop, you know, quickly. So Jer was like 11 years old. And when Jer was 11, we've got two sons. Jer was this big when he was 11. Our son Brad, who's the youngest, he was this big when he was eight, I'm serious. He's, he's a big boy. And uh, I said, I told Jerry, I said, don't do that. That's not good. You're going to get hurt. Well, he did it again. And we were on the road somewhere. We were in the motorhome. I said, Jerry, don't do that. Well, he did it again. I said, Jerry, I'm going to tell you one more time. If you do that again, if, if, if you don't get hurt, I'm going to paddle you. I said, I'm going to make you drop your britches. And I'm going to paddle you. That's what I said to him. I said, Jeremy. And so he did it again. And he came back in the morning. And I said, Jerry, what did I tell you? You're going to get hurt doing that. What did I tell you I was going to do if you did it again? He said, Dad, I know I'm sorry. I turned around to do something. I turned around to do something. It was like 10 seconds. I turned back around. 
And there is Jeremy standing. His britches are down to his ankles. I said, what are you doing? He said, you told me you were going to spank me. I said, pull your pants back up. I didn't spank him. And he did. It just seemed right. I needed something to relax me. But now I don't even know where I'm at. Thanks, Max. I was. He, that's right. He, he, to this very day. God wants to change our goals. Right? Now let me get to my point here, Mike. It just. What a day. It's a great day. All right. Here's the second point. You guys are laughing at me now, aren't you? Thanks, Bob. Here's the second thing. God wants to change your attitude. He wants to change. You know, if I had to describe the initial attitude of the Egyptians, I'd call it panic. These guys were panic. The, the, the Egyptians were right there. And, and the, the Israelis were scared to death. They were scared to death. Panic always brings out the worst part of us. It always brings out just, just you know, I can imagine them turning to Moses and saying, thanks a lot, Mo, you big jerk, for bringing us out into the desert. Thanks, thanks for doing that. Second, they get delusional. They say, we should have stayed in Egypt, right? The, the Israelis, they even thought for a moment, let's go back to Egypt. Now, a lot of bad things happened to them there. A, 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 an Egyptian could come into your home and take your wife, could take your daughter, could take anything you had. And these guys are threatening, we, we need to go back to Egypt. And the third thing is this, they were cutting God out of their mentality. They, they, they were like, in their panic, they're, they're just completely leaving God out of the picture of their lives. And they've completely forgotten the 10 plagues that God just pulled off in Egypt. Again and again and again and again, God is showing his power. And he's showing it by defeating and bringing to its knees the most powerful nation in the world at that time. And they've just witnessed this incredible display of God's might in these plagues. They didn't do that. They should have been saying, you know, this looks pretty bad. But God can handle it. This looks really, really bad. These guys are strong, but our God is stronger. They're big, but our God is huge. God can take care of them. Let's, God, bring on plague number 11. But God is nowhere in their thinking because they're too afraid and they're too panicked. Do you ever find yourself like that? Virginia, do you ever find yourself like that? Do you ever get really, right? Some people do. They look for some way to get themselves out of it. They, they, it affects you physically. Oh, my stomach. I don't know why. I can't sleep at night. I'm just so concerned about that. And what do we do? We reach for a cigarette. We reach, well, or the, reach for a pint of scotch. I don't. Or a pint of tequila. Or a pint of Ben and Jerry's anyway. Pick me. <laughs> and when you realize that these things don't help for long, you look around and you look for someone to blame. It's your fault. Your spouse, your kids, a co-worker, anybody. Moses, it's your fault. If it weren't for you, we'd never be in this mess. I love the response of Moses. 
Remember Moses when he was back in Egypt? Remember he killed a guy? Remember that part? He killed this Egyptian and he buried him in the sand. Now things are different with this guy. He's not a hothead anymore. Listen to how he responds in verse 13 and 14. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm. And you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. I love this part. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. <laughs> the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Do you hear any panic in Moses' voice? <laughs> no. I only see peace. Isn't that who you want to be? Well, is it, don't, don't you just want some peace? Don't you want that shalom? Yes. Just peace in your life, peace in your family, peace when you put your head down on your pillow at night and you just go, you just hit it and you go. That's the person I want to be. There are three command, commandments here. First, don't be afraid. Fear is kind of that, I don't know if I'm making up a word, instinctual. Did I make up a word or is that a real word? You're, Max, you're an educator. Is that? It sounds good. I win. It's something that just comes naturally. But Moses is saying, don't be afraid. The second one is um, stand firm. I know you feel like running away, Bob. Or running away and going hiding somewhere. But, but, but don't do that. And the third thing is uh, be still. Be still. At least on the inside, be at rest. Be at rest. Be still. For God, they have chariots. And the water is, is deep. Don't be afraid. Stand firm and be still. But my daughter is still living with that idiot. She won't even call us. Don't be afraid. Stand firm. Be still. My doctor has called me in for another meeting. Just doesn't sound good. Don't be afraid. Stand firm. Be still. I think my job is going to fire me. I've been there 12 years. I think they're downsizing. Don't be afraid. Stand firm. Be still. But how? Because you will see the deliverance that the Lord will bring you. The Lord will fight for you. And that just leads me to the last thing. And I'll, I hate to rush through, but let him change your confidence. Let him change what you're confident in. Let him change what you're trusting in. Let him change what, what is, you know, when the Egyptian people or the Israelis saw the Egyptian army approaching, what do you think, what do you think that did to their confidence? You know, they're all rejoicing, you know, they're, they're out of Egypt, they're sh shaking hands, they're patting each other on the back, giving each other high fives. Now they see this big dust cloud in the air. They knew about that army. They knew it was probably the most imposing military machine in the whole world at that time. I can imagine them after seeing all this evidence that the Egyptians are getting closer and they start to hear the rumble of chariot wheels. They can hear the clang of, of armor and very quickly their confidence is just evaporating, just going away. Where do you find your confidence? Where is your confidence? Is it, again, is it in this? Is it in you? Is it in your physical strength and beauty and health? Is it in your money? Is it in your job? Is that where, is that where your confidence is? 
Is that what makes you feel secure and gives you a sense of well-being? The Bible says that there are basically two places where we get our confidence from. First of all, it's the flesh. And secondly, it's you can trust God. And the Israelis were doing the thing that comes naturally. They were trusting in the flesh. We've talked about this before. There are two realities. There's the reality of things, what we see, what we feel. Then there's the reality of God. And God wants us to trust in and, and find our security in the, the reality of him. Not the reality of this. They were trusting in what their eyes could see. And their eyes told them that there was no hope. None. Zip, nil, none of the above. I'm sure they believed in God at some level, but at that moment, the real thing their hearts were leaning on wasn't God at all. And we do that. God loved these people so much that he wanted to change them. He wanted to change them from being flesh trusters to being God trusters. The way he does that usually is to put us in impossible situations that we can't get out of. I have goosebumps. I can't. He, he doesn't just allow us sometimes like a a great loving father, he, he puts us in a situation so that we can learn the hard lesson of trusting in him, especially when we're forced to trust him. Maybe that's why you're in the situation you're in right now. I, I don't know. Because your faith in God is very theoretical. It looks good on paper. But at a gut level, it just isn't there. It's not battle-tested faith. God wants that for you. In the book, in the New Testament, Paul wrote something to this church at Corinth. He said this. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, <coughs> about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we even the spirit of life itself. Indeed, we, we felt as if we had received the sentence of death. Doesn't that sound like the Israelis and what they might have been feeling? They were getting ready to be chewed up by the Egyptians. Why would God allow that? Paul says, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. <laughs> Cannot a God who can raise the dead be counted on? God designs, I think, these situations, because when we go through them, we see God coming through for us, we actually start to understand that God is more trustworthy, that he is more able to to come through and more, more worth leaning on than any outward thing, any human being, that we would never believe these things had God not allowed us to go through that, that furnace. That, and when he has tried me, I will come forth as gold type mentality. This event, when they saw the bodies of all these Egyptians trying to cap them, uh, when they saw these bodies on the shore, it so marked them deeply that this event, the parting of the Red Sea, is referred to in the Bible dozens and dozens of times as proof that God is faithful. Let me wrap this up here. If you're in a situation like that, and maybe you are, you don't tell me everything, What would it mean for you if you were to walk by faith and not by sight? There's a question we need to ask because it really affects everything. Listen to this, Virginia. This is really good. This is good stuff. I thought of this at like 1 o'clock in the morning. This was good. I'm going to say something here. 
can we really be sure that God will come through for us? Can, have you really thought of that? I'm going to tell you. I'm glad you asked, Diana. This is great. I mean, yeah, he came through for the Israelis, right? He came through for them. He parted the sea for them, but does that mean he's going to come through for me? Is that, is that what he... And here's the question. I answered this last week. <coughs> Why did God come through for them? Because of this. Let me, let me read a verse to you. He said, I'm about to bring this terrible plague on the people of Egypt. And I'm going to distinguish between the people of Egypt and the people of Israel. And here's how I'm going to distinguish between them. The people of Israel are going to trust me enough to put, listen to this, the blood of the Passover lamb above their doorpost so that the blood is going to mark you as my people and you'll be spared from my judgment and you'll be set free. The reason that God came through for the Israelites is that they were his special people. And that special relationship was marked by what? The blood of a spotless lamb. That's why he led them out of Egypt. That's why he parted the Red Sea. That's why he would continue to come through for them because they were his special people marked by that blood. Okay. Here's the answer to my question and Gary, your question, because I can see it written all over your face. Why will God come through for me? Can we really be sure that God will come through for me? I think this is the answer. If we are trusting in the blood of the spotless lamb, Jesus Christ, then we are his special people. And we can be confident that he'll come through for us in his own way, in his own time, and he will come through for us. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. <clears throat> Do you know that verse, Gary? He knows all this stuff. What shall we say then in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us, all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Do you see what he's saying? The most, listen to this. I'm gonna, this is why I wrap it up here. The most impossible situation. The biggest problem that you and I have ever faced, the widest river, was the fact that our sin separated us from God. It's the fundamental problem with humanity. We've messed up our lives and separated ourselves from the creator. And in the face of that massive problem, God came through by sending his son, the spotless, without defect, lamb of God, to suffer for me, Connie, and you, so that we could be reconciled to him. And if that's true, if that's true, how will he not also graciously give us all things? I have goosebumps again, I'm sorry. In other words, if God got us across the biggest river, the river of death and condemnation and hell, don't you think that he'll get us across all the rest of those little rivers in our lives, Diana? All the rest are just little rivers. Don't you think God's going to get you through it? Guys, here's the promise. No matter what kind of Red Sea situation you're in this morning, God will bring you through it. No matter what it is, so look for his glory, refuse to panic, wait on him, stand firm, be still.
because he's going to bring you through it. That's all I got. That's all I got. My voice is done. Let's pray together. Father.